Welcome, welcome to the Wealth Wisdom Financial Podcast and YouTube channel. So glad to have with me today our guest, Jessica Johnson. If you're in the corporate rat race right now and have a mind that's creatively wondering where you're going to go and how you're going to follow your passion into a life that you can only dream of right now, you're going to hear Jessica's story because she's blazed that trail for you and is living an amazing life now, able to be remote, not even like in her actual home of Florida right now for the whole summer. And I know a lot of us want to live that kind of life now. And I'm excited for how we can be inspired to follow that and make it happen and make some money mistakes along the way, but learn how to recover from them as well, which I know Jessica's got a whole story for us there. So join me in welcoming her. Jessica, give us a little bit of behind the scenes. What do you want to make sure our audience knows about who you are, what you're doing today? Yeah, thank you for that introduction and for having me. Um, so as Amanda mentioned, I own a content marketing agency, Buzzworthy Content, um, and I also get to mentor writers in how to create their own profitable freelance businesses. And it's been a winding journey to do that. I'm sure we'll talk more about that. And, and money mindset and management has played a huge, huge part of it. But yeah, I just, I feel very fortunate because years ago I was in corporate and I know what that feels like and could only dream of being able to do the digital nomad thing or work remotely or even work from my own home, you know, so um, to get to do that and even surpass my corporate salary and do creative fulfilling work for brands that I love. It's amazing what can happen in a few years, even if every day feels like you're just kind of piecing one step mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Okay. So we now we have the vision. We know where we're going. Take us back to little Jessica. What was money like for you growing up? Ooh, that's such a good starting place. Um, so money for me starting out or in my family, it was like money was functional, but it wasn't necessarily something that you wanted to talk about that you wanted to have too much of even. I think it was a little bit suspect, like anyone who had a lot, um, you know, potentially like got it or was, I don't know, greedy or you know what I mean? Like not mm -hmm. always, but I just feel like there were those undertones of like, yes, have money to do the things you want to do, but don't ever like want more than is necessary, right? Or don't ever mm -hmm. like talk about it too much. So that's kind of the environment I grew up in. I feel like my parents, um, you know, have really come along on this journey with me and they have been so good about even celebrating my successes or being part of the wins now. But like, it was kind of a journey, I feel like for me to get there and unwind some of the money stuff in my head and in just the culture around me too. Yeah. So I, I grew up in a very like, you know, similar way that we kind of distrusted rich people, even if we never said right. it, it was kind yeah. of how we all operated. When yeah. you started out on your own, you know, as a young adult, what was your like learning about how money works and what you wanted to see happen in life? What did that look like then? You know, that looked like when I started out as a corporate adult and was, um, yeah, it was when I started out as a young adult was in corporate America. I feel like for me, I had enough, right? But it was always up against that line of like just enough and then struggling to get past the point where there was overflow or abundance, right? But I felt taken care of and I felt like I was proud to make my own salary, make my own money. Um, you know, I worked since I was a teenager and even in college, you know, worked while going to school. So it was kind of this interesting balance of like, I had support around me. I always had enough, but like crossing into that territory of overflow, which now that I talk about my childhood, I'm like, oh, that makes sense why that was kind of like something that we didn't cross into. Yeah. But that's kind of how it was. And I'm happy to share specifics there or anything, but that's what comes to mind. Yeah, I, I'm totally curious. Um, like anything that you feel like felt like a ceiling for you or a roadblock that you had to bust through? Like what were some of the key indicators that you, you weren't pushing to that overflow or how did that translate into your life? I remember when I first started out in entrepreneurship, like my dream was the 10 K months. Like I was like, if I can make those 10 K months, I, that is, all I want in life. And then I actually got into this um, group, one of my first kind of training programs. 
And it wasn't even about money or money mindset, but the way that people in that group talked about money, they were on the scale of 30K or 40K months. And I remember thinking that was like wild. Like I was like, oh my gosh, these people are on another level. But it really opened up my mind for the first time to like money doesn't have to be something you like talk about in silence. Mm -hmm. It's not a taboo topic. Like politics might be at the dinner table. Like people are talking about it and they're talking about their strategies and they're talking about how much they want and they're celebrating for each other. So that I think 10K was that first ceiling. And once I started to get acclimated to that group, I was like, could I get like 30 or 40K eventually? And then now I feel like I'm in circles where people are starting to talk about 80K or 100K or even more, maybe a million a month, you know, but it just, it really blew open that idea that there were ceilings that were correlated to what you could make in corporate even. Yeah. Yeah. It's so important who we surround ourselves with and, you know, like people talk about, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I don't want to be the highest income person in the room. Yeah. Do you want to keep growing and have no ceilings for you? Yeah. Let me go back to corporate life really quickly. How did you know that you wanted something more and that there was something different um, that like made you decide to go pursue it? I was always um, entrepreneurial looking back. I just didn't, there wasn't a word for it years ago Mm -hmm. as much. I think it's become much more of a thing now with, you know, the internet and online and everything. But even years ago, it wasn't really considered a career track. Um, So ever since I was little, I was always making up little businesses or I had, you know, a little day camp that I started when I was like 11 or 12 and then get into, you know, corporate. And it really went back to that community type of thing where I, even at networking events that I was going to purely for corporate America purposes, I would occasionally meet people who were entrepreneurs or business owners. And I just became like very curious and interested about how this lifestyle they'd constructed. I just thought, wow, like you don't have this commute. You are building something from scratch. Like they seem to really enjoy it. The freedom they had was really interesting to me. And so that just started to spark this idea and normalize it almost that there could be another path out there that I just hadn't considered. And so I really just was in a position in corporate where I had, you know, hobbies and nights and weekends. And I started taking classes just for the fun of it. And like, nutrition and wellness. And that was what first sparked the idea of like, oh, wait, maybe this could be a path, right? And it's evolved since then. But I really think it was kind of just seeing the first glimmers of other people pursuing that track and then starting to think, how would I do this? And what would I do it about? And what would it look like? And at first I resisted it because I was like, I finally have the career track I want. I have the income, I have the salary, the promotion, but it just became this thing that I could not resist and really kept thinking about until it finally kind of emerged (laughs) and I built something from it. Yeah, just underscores the importance of relationships and community and um, how seeing someone else do it opens our eyes that we can do it too. And then I wanna highlight also that that kind of illusion of security is often what holds people back. And you know, you felt secure, you're on the right track, all those kind of things. And I call it an illusion because it really is. All of that could have crumbled with one, you know, two week notice, right? Or an immediate firing or something like that that's come out of the blue on too many people. So kudos to you that you didn't stay in that safe place and you went after it. Yeah. Yeah. I bet there were some mistakes along the way too, that we could help our audience avoid. What were some of those things that as you started pursuing went wrong? If you got to go back and do it all over again, you'd want to advise yourself to avoid or do a little differently. Mm, That's a really good question. So I think one of the first ones is I, um, like I was almost always trying to find this magic bullet course or like training program or strategy. And in hindsight, I I feel like it could have been more direct if I had found a mentor instead that could work with my unique situation and what I wanted to create and help me craft it from there versus going through these, you know, five step like workbooks or whatever and trying to figure it out on my own, right? Because at a certain point, then you're just piecing together all these little piecemeal solutions, but you're not actually seeing the whole picture. So it's kind of a double thing where on the one hand, I would have invested definitely in a mentor and a coach from the get go. And then two, um, while I'm glad that I invested in a lot of these things, because they all certainly helped in a way, I do think it would be just being a little more judicious with looking less for those one off points and trying to hack it together myself and instead kind of finding the complete picture and path. 
I got there eventually, but it was, you know, a few years in and <laughs> definitely like, you know, trial and error until then. So that's one. Um, another one is, you know, through some of those larger programs, um, I was led to like Facebook advertising and really like expensive strategies early on. And there was a lot of talk and kind of pressure around like, if you want to be all in, you really like invest now and you'll make it up later. And it got me into this cycle where I wanted it so badly that I was willing to do whatever they said, but it wasn't necessarily like making financial sense. I just had such a dream that eventually it would because that's what they were saying to do yeah. so in that sense I would have even like worked as a financial person or something or just developed what really feels good to me does like putting this money out before I have it feel good maybe to some extent but like to what degree am I willing to go in and where are kind of the stop gaps and like checking and saying what's working is there another way to do this like what's the overall strategy when is enough enough because it definitely pulled me into you know spending more than i ever thought i would you know burn through the savings so those two stand out as like um just like getting the right mentorship and then also being clear on like what financially feels good to you and what doesn't ahead of time and having kind of a roadmap for that because once you get into it it's so easy to be emotional and it can just lead you down a trajectory that took me time to get out of too yeah. One of the awesome parts of being an entrepreneur and how a lot of people realize they're entrepreneurs is that they're idealistic. They get that grand vision. They know it can happen even if the rest of the world says it's impossible. But yeah. also that idealism can lead us down some pretty hard financial paths as well. Yeah. And I love that kind of both of those involve like a personalization almost. There's, you know, there are really great principles and pieces of information out there. I'm sure those courses that you took were accurate, but yeah. none, nothing was personalized except for that mentor. Same with, there's a lot of financial advice out there, a lot of financial ways you can go, but you really have to personalize and make sure you're doing what is right for you in that moment. So I love those. Um, too much of what people do isn't personalized to them. And we're all unique. Yeah. We got we to gotta make our own path and it's going to be different for all of us. Exactly. And that's yeah. so true for entrepreneurs. It's just like you're building something because you don't want to do it the way everyone else has done it. There's something in you. So it's like almost applying that to different parts of your life and finding someone who's willing to walk that journey with you um, makes like so much of a difference and can save you a lot of that time of undoing things later on or just heartache too of realizing, oh, I didn't have to force myself into this one box. There was another way. So it definitely yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. And it's kind of asking the question, well, if that worked for them, what can I learn from them that will yeah. apply to me rather than yeah. if that worked for them, then I'm going to do that. It's like, well, exactly. what about that would work for me too? I think yes. it's a very different question. So as you've had success, as you've seen those $10,000 months and above, what have you noticed about any kind of limiting beliefs and how you've busted through them to continue on your trajectory toward those $100,000 months? You know, I would say a big one um, that I'm like, I'm, it's a recurring one that I'm working through and it's money and otherwise is almost just like that visibility and taking up space and that you can have all these big desires and that doesn't make you greedy or like braggy or like you're taking too much. Like, I feel like I used to have this perspective that if I had, if I made money, I was taken from someone else. And now I really disbelieve in that. I'm like, it's not this pie chart where if I make more, someone else makes less. If anything, I've seen in my own life, when I make more, I give more to others. I invest in things I'm passionate about and that I care about. Like your dollar is your vote in the world for what you want to see more of. Um, and so that's been one that I have really been massaging and like working through for a long time and it can inspire others too because anyone I've seen go after this and even like I think Jay Shetty said this like you you sometimes can dream through other people so something you see them having doesn't mean you can't have it or that they get it and you don't it means that that's what's possible for you and if it's in your awareness like it's that much closer to you so I think that's been a big one too is just you can have this and you can do amazing things with it and um like good people do more good in the world with more resources yeah. so that's one that has been a big one that I'm continually working on and I feel like even with my podcast and all that stuff I'm trying to just unwind that 
fear around visibility and even this is what I think or taking up space and just be like continually rehearsing that and practicing it and almost like you get more proof too like you make money and you do good things you just start to believe differently because you see it in your reality yeah yeah I love it so much I could comment on there too (laughs) Um, Do you feel like this story is more common for us as women to kind of have that same, especially the taking up space, being visible, being willing to show up and be heard and put our true opinions out there? I feel like that's a big hurdle that I hear from a lot of women. I do. It's so interesting. I'm reading this book now called We Should All Be Millionaires, and she talks a lot about where that even maybe came from historically. But I do feel it's such an interesting thing because, you know, here my husband and he talks with his friends, they're all talking about, you know, how much money they want to make, what they're going to do with it, what strategy is going to help them more. Like they're going as big as they possibly can. And then for some reason, I feel like it's been conditioned for women, like it's distasteful or something to have that same kind of conversation. And I hope that's changing, right? And that could just be the circles that I've been in and I'm continually evolving. But I do feel like I notice that more with women women. And I think that's what's amazing about what you're doing. And like even this online space and social media and everything where, you know, there's pros and cons to it. But I think it is opening up this conversation and showing more examples of actually, like, that's not the only way. And look at these people doing all this good with all these resources. And and also one thing that really shifted my beliefs around there too, is I tried to think I was like, what's one bad thing that comes from women having more money? And I literally could not think of anything, but I can think of a million reasons that are good, you know, that yeah. lift up their communities and their family and themselves, and they can have better care for themselves so they can give back more. And it's not even about them just giving and giving, giving, but like it's, they can take care of themselves, you know, and it's, there's so many good reasons that I think I've really just started to be like, no women, like we need to make as much as we possibly can um, because everyone is better, including ourselves when we do. Yeah. Okay. I love this. This is great. And I I love that you shifted from they, like women need more money. What, what's the worst that they, you know, if they have more money, what's the bad thing that would happen to we, because we are women as well. Right. And yeah, you you know, what (laughs) nothing bad's going to happen from us having more money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, That's a good call. Yeah. Um, Now I want to get in a little bit to your area of expertise. Let's say people are like, okay, I'm in, I'm going to take away the ceilings of my income potential. I'm going to show up, take up space, have my voice heard. How do we do that? What's like tips, ideas, ways that we can make sure that we're creating, as you call it, buzzworthy kind of Mm -hmm. content? So there's so many ways to begin, depending on where, you know, people are at on their journey. For me, when I was first starting, it could be as simple as just like absorbing and getting familiar. I read so many books on money mindset and listened to so many podcasts like this. And it's just that started to shift the stories I was constantly repeating. And it also helped me catch the tapes that were playing in my head around money and start to question them and choose different ones. Um, in terms of my, you know, area of expertise with the content and mentoring writers, like, I think it can look like even starting to learn a skill that you can use to generate wealth, whether you want to have a whole business or whether you want to have it be another income stream. So for me, that looks like really learning content writing and content strategy, um, building some solid work samples. You don't even have to go work with a company, just build some writing samples yourself because that's what will speak for your skills. And then there's so many ways to get in front of clients. And, you know, obviously I can talk about this all day, but just a few that come to mind or um, freelance sites. You can use even Facebook like marketing groups. You can use networking events. You can use um, like LinkedIn posts. There's so many, so many ways. You can send a sample to a company just to make a warm introduction that way and show them you really care. And that's a really like a direct path where you, what I love about it is you don't have to spend years building this social media following. It can be just a direct connection with another company that needs work and then, then pays you right for every hour that you spend working. Um, And so, you know, depending on what rates you want to charge, even $50 an hour, if you're working a full work week becomes a six figure hundred K year. You want to double that to a hundred, that's a 200 K year, or you can work less time and also devote more into the other things you care about in the rest of your life. So there's just so much opportunity to scale with that. And it's such a simple model. Um, and then, like I said, it can be a side hustle, it can be a side income stream that gives you more freedom to travel, to do things you love, to vote with your dollar, or it can become a whole career in and of itself as it did for me, which gives you as much freedom and creative fulfillment as you want to. 
Yeah. For people that are aiming toward financial freedom or financial independence, um, really like learning content writing gives them the ability to pick and choose when they work, how they work, um, how that adds to their income and their wealth or becomes just part of their lifestyle. I love that. Sounds great. Yeah, exactly. I know people are going to want to learn more about what you do and uh, check out your show and participate in learning more from you. What's the best way for people to connect with you? Sure. So hijessicajohnson.com is my website. And from there, you can learn more about, you know, my agency, um, the course that I teach, which teaches, you know, everything we just mentioned, both the writing and content side, as well as the business side of growing a business. You can find my podcast on there. So that's kind of your one-stop shop. There's a free copywriter starter kit for anyone who's curious. And then if you're more in the social channels, um, it's the same thing, but it's at Hi Jessica Johnson for Instagram and post a lot of kind of content tips and information on there too. And correct me if I get this wrong, but the podcast is called Bright Life Podcast. What a great name. What a way to think about what we're doing in our businesses, in our lives, personally, and also with our money, that we want to be a bright light into the world with uh, everything, all of it. And thank you for bringing that light to us today um, and shining so brightly with your information, ideas, and even just your smile and the way you've communicated them. It's been really fun. Anything else you wanted to make sure to share or any gems of wisdom for the audience today before we sign off? Gosh, just that I'm grateful for what you are doing and helping people. That financial part is such a big part of people's lives. And it's not something that needs to be overlooked or like tucked in a corner or um, you, you know, go out and do your work, but then the money's like hidden. It can be part of this beautiful life you create. And even on that note of the bright life, like it can look different for everyone. So my version of a bright life might look different than anyone else's, but that's the beauty of it. And I think finance can be such a like enabler of that. And it is the thing that gives you the resources to go live it. So just love the connection between what you're doing and how you're supporting that as well. And thank you for having me and letting me share more about my side of it as well. Yeah. Thanks for being here again, folks, go check out hi, jessicajohnson.com to get all of the links, all of the ways to learn more from Jessica and find that bright life that you're looking for, for yourself and for your family now and in the future. We'll catch you next time here on the Wealth Wisdom Financial Podcast and YouTube channel. We hope that you live long and profit.